So today we are glad to have uh, like Professor Stephen Edward from uh, Columbia University to give us a talk about uh, uh, the future hardware. If you have a trillion transistors, what do with, uh, what do we do with it? So let's welcome Professor. Thanks for coming. So. Coming here, actually, there's a, a, a workshop tomorrow at Stanford when I'm presenting more or less the same thing. And I'm going to be arguing with a bunch of other people who have different opinions about this. But the premise of the workshop is, so we have billions of transistors on a chip at the moment. Uh, in a blink of an eye, we're going to be up to trillions. You know, what do we do with all of them? You know, what, you know, what are the chips going to look like? So first, what I want to do is talk about what we're not going to do with them. Uh, we're already at this point where uh, a single, single-threaded CPU just doesn't make any sense anymore, right? You know, Intel and HP and all the rest of these guys are just simply given up and said, oh, you know, we can't do this anymore. We can't make them any fast. They, basically, they can't figure out how to waste enough transistors to make it worthwhile. So it's not going to be just a single CPU. Uh, we probably will have big memory chips around. But again, that's not all that interesting, right? One of the things that I'm beginning to worry about, and you notice this, you know, how long does it take you to get the information out of a trillion uh, transistor memory chip uh, so that you can do something useful with it, right? I mean, you need a lot of pins and so forth. So it's still not very interesting. And if you start looking at it, you know, a gigahertz clock versus a trillion bits, it takes a while. Um, so another thing is to just say, well, we're going to take existing systems as we know them and love them and so forth and sort of merge them onto the chip. That's already happening to a certain degree. Um, but I don't think that doing, say, Ethernet on a chip or TCP on a chip or what have you is, is the right thing. Those are you know, very interesting protocols. They work very well. But they're designed to attack a different level, a different assumption that you can make about reliability. Right? In particular, you don't really have to worry about the fool with the backhoe on a chip, whereas that's kind of one of the main uh, points of TCP IP is that you can, you can deal with nonsense like that. So um, you know, that's reasonable. We're not really super good at. Uh, programming systems consisting of a whole bunch of computers connected well, okay, maybe you guys are, are pretty good, but most of the rest of the world isn't. Uh, this is tricky. So I, I don't think just simply you know, moving an entire server room down to a, a single chip is quite the right thing to do. Um, another thing we can consider doing is say, well, okay, it's not memory, but let's just make it a big field programmable gate array, right? You know, choose all of the, all of the things. Um, the problem with that is that to come up with that much hardware and an FPGA is already rather difficult. Furthermore, I don't know of any interesting system that doesn't have some software running on it anymore. You know, it's a, it's the last example I could think of is you know, like late 1970s, early 1980s, or whatever. They still built video games that are discrete TTL parts, right? It's been a long time since that. Since that. Individual chips, of course, might not have processors on them. But no interesting system doesn't have software in it. So these are the premises I have. So this is my hypothesis about what these are going to look like. And this is a very pie in the sky. And there's a lot of details uh, that I'm leaving out here, of course. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to argue what the CPU on these, on these things should look like. Uh, but the basic idea is this. You know, if you've got a square uh, flat thing, what do you do? You put a grid on it, because that's sort of the only arrangement that you can you know, think of that's easy to replicate and all the rest of it. This is what we do with memories and all the rest of it, you know, even to the point we're doing with this processors. Um, and there's going to have to be some fairly clever communication uh, system within that mesh. We know how to do clever routing things on 2D meshes. The supercomputing people have done this for a long time. We actually understand that pretty well. And furthermore, just routing random wires on a chip like this is going to be ridiculous just because there's so many of them. So it's going to have to be some fairly orderly uh, arrangement like this. Now, OK, so you've got a communication mesh. Well, you've got to do something somewhere, right? You can't just be passing bits around, although that's mostly what uh, processors do these days anyway. Uh, you've got to you know, stop and actually do a little computing at some point. Um, so what I'm going to claim, and this is definitely not to scale, is that at these grid points, you're probably going to want to have some sort of central processing unit, something that, you know, some sort of stored program computer executing code of one form or another. Um, you're going to want a lot of memory no matter what, because also uh, uh, no interesting application doesn't need a lot of memory or could not use a lot of extra memory for some reason or what have you. You've got that. Um, another argument 
is that you don't just want a big software system because you're not going to be able to get the performance you want. Now, Intel can afford to do this, you know, just give us, you know, uh, dual core whatevers or, 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 or what have you, uh, and they're fine. They've got a big enough market all to themselves. However, there are people for whom just plopping, you know, the next, you know, 80 watt uh, processor down is not going to work, right? We can't do that for cell phones, can't do that for automotive applications, any of these things. Um, so we're going to need some sort of differentiation. Now, the problem is, is at the moment, it takes something like a million dollars just to get a mask set for a typical high-end ASIC, high-end chip or whatever. And that price is just going to keep going up and up because the number of layers keeps going up, because the number of transistors, because of the precision and so forth. And we're seeing this also in the cost of design for these chips. It's just going through the roof. Right. I, I remember reading at some point that Intel had sunk roughly the same amount of money into the Pentium as the U.S. had, had spent putting a man on the moon. Right. That was the first Pentium. You know, now we're, we're quite a bit beyond that. Um, that's just not scalable. Right. You know, Intel can afford to do that. Essentially, nobody else can um, design you know, entirely custom chips like this. So my prediction the way that the costs are going for manufacturing these chips and so forth is that the number of different chips that you can fabricate in a year is going to drop substantially. Um, this number has already been dropping for quite a while. I used to work at Synopsys just down the road, and one of the things they worried about was the number of, of ASIC design starts, because of course that's when they could sell their, their products. And the number is, is slowly decreasing. And the problem is just that it just costs too much to design one of these, uh, a, a chip completely from scratch. Um, and so instead, what I see is I see the number of chips that are, uh, the number of FPGAs, say, going into consumer electronics and various other things going up a lot because they're a lot cheaper to, manu to get the first one out. You still have the design cost, but uh, in Xilinx or Altera have done a lot of the engineering for you. Um, it seems that that's a, a, an interesting direction to go. So I'm going to guess by the time we get to a trillion chips, uh, a trillion transistors on a chip, no one company, maybe not even Intel, is going to be able to design more than a couple of them a year. Uh, and so instead, the way people are going to differentiate it, the cell phone folks or whatever, is uh, to be able to program sort of the FPGA components of these uh, uh, chips somehow to get you know, more specialized uh, behavior. Now, that's all kind of leading up to the main point of it. What I want to talk about most is what the CPU ought to, ought to be like. And my argument is that it's not just sort of the, the same old stuff that we're fairly familiar with for, for processor architecture. This is not going to be the Intel you know, core you know, 64 duo quad whatever. Um, it's going to be quite a bit more specialized, and maybe a bit simpler in, in a variety of ways. And this is what I want to try to convince you of today. So specifically, what I'm going to try to convince you of is it's a so-called precision time or, or PRET processor. This, this PRET acronym, which is rather an awful acronym, um, is uh, one that my former advisor and I came up with at, at, at Berkeley just for precision timed. Um, the basic idea behind a PRET processor is that you can predict its performance. You can predict the number of clock cycles that a computation is going to take as well as you can predict the function, as you can predict what, what's going to happen to the bits that you feed into it. And I, I'm going to try to argue for the rest of this talk that that's a good thing, that we're going to need this, we're going to want this for these sorts of applications going forward. This is quite a change from what we're accustomed to. So I want to start this argument by pointing out that embedded systems is, is where the action is at. Now, of course, I'm going to make an argument like that because this is where my research is and this is how I convinced the NSF to give me money. So this is, this is fairly obvious. However, if you start looking at the numbers, I think I can make a, a reasonably compelling argument for this. So a few years ago, 6.5 billion processors, you know, this is counted both individual you know, Intel-style things plus all the way down to the really tiny microcontrollers or, or something. And of course, if you look at the volumes, the microcontrollers have, have actually long dominated uh, uh, the, the unit numbers over the Intel stuff. Of course, Intel makes a lot more money off of theirs because they can choose a pre uh, charge a premium for it. However, of these 6.5 billion processors, 97% of them went into embedded applications, right? The other 3% went into desktops and things that you sort of think of as computers, uh, but the vast majority of them don't get used that way. And this is kind of scary. Now, I mean, mind you, you know, some reasonable chunk of this is cell phones, for example. Um, this is, rather this is rather terrifying. Um, 
uh, nearly uh, three quarters of a million uh, cell phones sold in 2004. So each of those have two processors, so you can you can figure out a reasonable chunk from there. You know, game machines, um, all sorts of other applications. Um, something like 60 or 70 go into a typical automobile these days. It's rather unreal the numbers. So. This is my argument that, okay, yeah, you know, there are these server farms and these desktop machines and so forth, but there are a vanishing fraction of the number of chips that are produced these days. The, the majority of them are going into places, you know, the, the, the video projector, the video camera, the cell phones that you all have like two or three of in your pocket, at least I do. Um, kind of scary. Now, the thing about embedded systems is the applications are different than the traditional things you find running on traditional operating systems. And so specifically, I'm going to argue that the challenges are mostly of the form, take the form of hard real-time systems. And so these include avionics. These are you know, controlling control surfaces in the air, aircraft. There's all kinds of systems like that. Um, automotive is a large and growing application area for uh, for uh, embedded processors, like I say, you know, 80 or 100 in a, in a typical car. And this, this number, well, they're, they're actually trying to get that number down because they don't like that many parts, but the number of individual programs running in a car is actually huge these days and is, is uh, looking at growing. If you go and talk to, you know, BMW or whatever, they say, well, you know, we've got this kind of interesting computer and it's, it's got these weird peripherals, you know, you know uh, uh, rubber tires and an internal combustion engine and so forth, but it's really the software that that uh, lets us differentiate our cars from you know, Audi or whoever. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, multimedia, right, uh, everybody has a couple of DVD players at home, and now everybody's going to have a, a, a Blu-ray player, uh, video game consoles, things like that. Um, all kinds of consumer electronics. The volumes here are just enormous. Uh, and all of these have the property that, yeah, you've got to compute something, but the speed at which you compute it is often just as important as the values that you compute. Um, I, the analogy I like to give is if you, you think about a brake controller in a car, um, if you garbage collect while you're pressing the brake and it, you know, okay, you get the answer but it's a couple of seconds late, it gives new meaning to the word system crash. Okay, so what we're familiar with in the computer science world is that we don't, when we're thinking about the correctness of a processor, we don't think about how fast it goes. I mean, we want it to go as fast as possible but you know, nowhere in the, you know, in the data book or whatever does it exactly say, okay, this is going to take this many cycles under these conditions or whatever. It, this used to be the case, but no longer. Right? It'll tell you exactly what happens to the registers and the status, flag, status registers and all the rest of that stuff and, and kind of vaguely what happens to memory these days. Uh, but that's about it. Um, and this is so entrenched that we're probably not even aware that it's happening anymore. Um, and this gives us a lot of advantages, uh, you know, programming languages, virtual memory, all of this stuff, that sort of standard computer science stuff, relies on this abstraction of uh, I'm doing computation in some order, I'm doing it as fast as I can, and it's, it's ordered, but I'm not setting the time exactly. Um, but from time to time, time does matter. Uh, I like this photo uh, because it's the only example I can find of uh, 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 engineering notation being used in uh, a headline in a newspaper, right? You know, this, this was a, a couple of years, uh, last year, uh, Kevin uh, won the Daytona 500 by 20 milliseconds. I, I like this, you know, a great thing. So time can matter. Um, so one obvious question is, well, you know, good grief, you know, go get the, the uh, collection of real-time scheduling books off of your, off of your uh, bookshelf and get on with it. Um, the problem with that is, is that all of the abstractions they use hinge on knowing what the worst case execution time is for, some, for your collection of tasks. This is usually the model they start with. Now, if you're programming an 8-bit microcontroller where you can actually count the cycles quite easily, and there's a long tradition of doing this, um, this is actually just fine. The problem is, if you looked at a modern Pentium, say, and say, okay, I have this chunk of code, how much time is it going to take? Uh, you really can't tell. The variability can be huge because of caches and branch predictors and pipelines and all the rest of it. It's just numbing. And so as a result, being able to say what the worst case execution time, especially for a bunch of tasks that are all vying for the processor and being scheduled and all the rest of it, uh, it's really un unrealistic to be able to get very precise estimates for this. So if you look at 
what can affect it. So pipelines are actually probably the worst because they, they cause interactions, very complicated interactions, but unfortunately usually among fairly localized sets of instructions. Whereas if you look at branch prediction, um, you know, it could be effective of, of an instruction, you know, 100 uh, instructions away or 200 instructions away that can affect this. Even worse are caches where this can be affected by nearby instructions, by far instructions, by how the compiler lays things out in memory, how you know, the memory manager put things into memory, how the other processes have been playing with the, the cache and so forth. Very, very difficult to predict the effect of this. And there's, there's some work on it, but it's, it's really difficult. Uh, and this is really interesting, actually. Um, there's uh, a paper that was published a little while ago pointing out that certain processes in a modern processor, this was uh, looking at uh, instructions per cycle versus uh, level two cache miss times, is actually chaotic in the mathematical sense of the word. Uh, so on the left here, we have this plot of level two cache miss versus IPC for a particular application. Uh, in the center is a strange attractor created by a, uh, a nonlinear equation being iterated. And on the right, you have a herring. So I, it, you know, you can actually put mathematical quantifications on just how crazy these things are these days to figure out exactly what's going on in these processors. Now, crazy people have gone and tried to very carefully evaluate worst case execution time on, on a fairly modern processor. And this is probably the state of the art. Uh, this was done back in 2001. So they did it on a Motorola cold fire. Um, this was code that they got from Airbus uh, designed to represent uh, uh, the behavior of a typical task doing uh, controlled surface stuff. So this is uh, you know, making sure the ailerons do the right thing. And so they're really, really concerned that this runs at the right speed and will always run at the right speed and so forth. Um, so this is actually very simple code. No loops, if I remember. I think they're conditionals and they're memory accesses, but that's it. So very, you know, very, very simple code. But it's very complicated. This on the right here is the pipeline for this processor. It's particularly confusing because it has a shared instruction and data cache. So to really figure out what's going on with a cache, you have to understand how the program is interacting with the memory that it's fetching at various times. You know, this is really a dumb idea. Um, they were able to do this, but only by taking these relatively small snippets of code and expanding them out into these huge integer linear programming problems and, solve, and throwing it at some super expensive solver. And they could do it, but my feeling is, is that um, this is, they're trying to solve a problem that is just much too hard, right? There's nothing fundamental about this. There's no rule that says pipelines have to be that complicated. It's just a side effect of this assumption that it doesn't matter how fast things go, just that they go fast. So the problem in a nutshell is we have this incredibly precise timing in digital hardware, right? We can, you know, for a, a dollar, you can get a crystal oscillator that's correct within, you know, 100 parts per million, even better if you want it. Um, and then we put on all of this algorithmic complexity that throws that away completely, right? You can, you can get incredible accuracy and then suddenly throw it all away. So why do that is the central thesis here. Why not try to be much more careful and make performance and how predictable it is and the timing of all of that as predictable as the function of these chips, right? We describe in incredible detail, if you go looking up in a processor reference manual, exactly what's happening to this register and that register and the status register and so forth when you execute this instruction under these versions and so forth. Why not make provide models to the programmer and the compiler and so forth that are that precise, but also for timing. There's no reason why we can't do that. It was just we cho we've chosen not to. And so the, the argument is that we need to take a step back, look at computer architecture again, and go after precision timing as much as precision function. OK, so let's talk about all of the stuff that you have to rethink or change or modify a little bit to try to achieve that. One obvious thing, uh, one obvious source of unpredictability is, is caches in the, the memory hierarchy, 
Um, you know, I have far too much experience with this. I just recently upgraded the memory on my desktop machine. And until I did that, I had this case where you know, these programs would run reasonably fast, and then I would make the mistake of running some other extra little thing that I thought was not a big deal, and suddenly the machine would stop, start swapping. It would go, oh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 times the speed, or 1 10,000th the speed as it was before. You know, and it, basically, I've got to pull the plug, because it's going so slowly, it's just not, it's just not useful. Um, just turning off the caches in embedded systems, and some crazy people do this, gives you a 100x performance hit compared to you know, going off of main DRAM or whatever. So this is just not practical. We need to keep around memory hierarchy. This is a good idea. This is a way to make things go fast. I'm not saying go make things go slow. I'm saying make them go predictably fast. Um, but instead of caches which are sort of hiding in the background and don't really tell you what's going on and so forth, instead what we need to do is think about scratch pad memories which are exposed to the programmer somehow. And by the programmer, I mean either the person actually writing the code or perhaps the compiler or something like that. But the point is, is that that abstraction is exposed at a level where you can model it and you can understand it and you can predict it much better. You're still going to want to have a very large DRAM connected up to a smaller SRAM connected up to a very small SRAM with large mecha with mechanisms for fast data transfers between them. But the point is, is that we should be able to know when the processor is, is hitting there or hitting there or whatever, more or less because we tell it to. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of existing literature talking about how to deal with, with explicit uh, uh, memory hierarchies like this. Most of the arguments have been around power reduction. They make the, the argument quite rightly that caches are very power hungry because they're going fast and because they have all this extra uh, you know, content addressable memories and all the rest of that stuff in them. So most of these things actually are about, you know, look at the power we save. But our view of this is, well, this is very interesting, but more to the point, look at how much more predictable we can make the program. Look at the fact that we could write a compiler that would tell you exactly this section of code is going to take you know, 300 cycles to run exactly. Pipelines are another huge source of unpredictability, mostly because we've pushed them so far that there's a lot of interactions among the instructions in a pipeline. And if you look at it, the basic idea of a pipeline is a very simple one. But when you start looking at what has to happen with all the bypasses and under this condition, this gets connected over there and so forth, uh, it gets very messy very quickly. Now, of course, this is what the, the, the folks up in, uh, uh, in, in Oregon get paid to do and figure all this stuff out. Um, but it makes it very, very difficult for uh, a programmer or a compiler or whatever to understand exactly how fast a little section of code is going to run. So, uh, a very heretical idea is to say, let's still use pipelines. I mean, this is a good idea. It's a way to, to get more, uh, more performance out of a given piece of hardware. But instead of trying to make them single-threaded, um, use so-called thread-interleaved pipelines. And the idea is simply this. If you have an H-stage pipeline, have eight different instruction counters going simultaneously and have them independent. Have it so that each of them talk to a different register file so that you don't have collisions, so that you don't need bypassing or what have you. Now, of course, this chops the performance of an individual processor uh, down by a factor of eight compared to what, in theory, you might get if you had a you know, perfectly packed pipeline. Um, I'm going to argue, though, that first of all, we're on these big chips, we're going to have a whole bunch of processors anyway. So why not increase the number of threads available? Secondly, there's a limit to how much instruction level parallelism you can ever get, right? You know, it's a factor of three or four or something like that. And it's just, it's nearly impossible to squeeze much more of that out of sort of average written code. You, you know, in certain cases, you can get very lucky, but usually not. Um, so we're already sort of doing this already, right? You know, hyper-threading, simultaneous multi-threading or whatever is already sort of doing this more or less, realizing that, well, you know, there's just too many bypasses and, and, and uh, uh, connections and so forth. Instead, why don't we run multiple threads on the, uh, through the same ALU, basically? Okay, another question is, well, what about interrupts, right? This is a, a fundamental way of uh, uh, peripherals talking with a, with a processor, and certainly embedded systems always have lots of interrupts and lots of I.O. and so forth. Here's the crazy idea. Don't have an interrupt bit, but resort exclusively to polling uh, to access this, this I.O. stuff. And you think, well, geez, isn't this ridiculous? You're devoting an entire thread to doing nothing but saying, are you ready yet? No. Are you ready yet? No. Are you ready yet? No. 
well, you know, that, that seems really awful. But again, re you know, remember this vision that I have. We're going to have a, you know, a 64 by 64 grid of these CPUs. Each CPU is going to have you know, an eight deep pipeline running eight threads each. You're going to have leftover threads to play with. And it makes a lot more sense to do it this way. You can also give very precise, you know, essentially interrupt latency things, because if you have one thread dedicated to each you know, potential interrupt source, one each peripheral, uh, you know exactly how much, how much time it'll take you to respond to that. And you're no longer sharing resources. Let me talk about this business of inefficiency, though. This was the best data I was able to drag up. Uh, it would be very interesting uh, to do this on a more advanced processor. So if you look at a modern, very aggressive processor that has all of these units, all of these pipeline stages or whatever, an interesting question is, over a period of time, what fraction of the time are each of these stages actually being used? Right? If it's 100%, this is fantastic. The computer architects have done an amazing thing, figuring out all the, you know, done all the speculation or whatever, kept everything occupied. The thing is, is that it doesn't work that way. It's very, very difficult to keep all of a modern processor humming at once. And that's probably just as well anyway, uh, because if you manage to actually get the whole chip working, it would probably melt. So the sorts of numbers you, you saw, this is a rather old paper now. They were trying to argue for this. Um, and OK, the utilization of the, the energy units, you know, 12 to 50%, 50% is, is pretty impressive utilization. On the other hand, you know, like the shared, some of the shared buses and some of the address buses, um, of course, if you've got a, a program that's not using floating point, the floating point unit is just going to sit there you know, running NOPs essentially anyway. So this is happening already. So my point with all of this is that you know, don't be afraid to have you know, computational units not being used in a processor because it's going to happen anyway. And so why not put them, why not, why not do things like use polling style uh, I.O. rather than having an interrupt uh, system and then worrying about an operating system that has to prioritize the interrupts and interrupt handlers and all the rest of this stuff. Why not just simply say, okay, this thread handles that I.O., you know, handles that peripheral, end of story. How do you do communication in a PRET environment? Um, the communication we're accustomed to, again, is usually best effort, right? If you think about Ethernet or, or even if you think about uh, the buses on, on, on modern processors, they tend to be sort of best effort, right? You know, handshaking, send the data, hope that it comes back as quickly as possible. This becomes unpredictable as well. However, there are, all, are alternatives, and the real-time community has sort of figured this out one way or the other. The basic idea is to use uh, the so-called time-triggered buses or time-triggered communication. Um, in sort of the systems world, uh, the ATM networks were, were based along this line. But the idea is pretty simple. It's you take a relatively low speed heartbeat, you divide it up into some number of slots, and then you give each potential communication, uh, com uh, communicating agent one of those slots. And so, of course, you're not playing this game with the statistical uh, multiplexing or whatever. And of course, the maximum bandwidth is limited by the fact that you've pre-allocated all of this. On the other hand, you get a guaranteed amount of bandwidth from point A to point B. And of course, if you change these schedules per application or whatever, you can sort of tune it appropriately. Uh, an example of this is a, uh, a bus called FlexRay that's being used in cars now. And the idea is, is you've got a whole bunch of nodes connected up to multiple channels or something like that. Divide time into multiple slots. The first large chunk of slots are pre-allocated. You know, your, your turn, your turn, your turn. Uh, and then there's some time at the end where, OK, yeah, you can fight it out you know, for, for random things or whatever. But these work really reasonably well. They're reasonably well understood. Again, it's quite a departure from, you know, the, the, the packet view of the world that you get with Ethernet and so forth. But if you want to get real time, this is how it's understood. How do you deal with shared resources in general? Right? A really good question. I gave this, this uh, talk like this at Altera. They said DDR2. How do you deal with huge off-chip memories, right? This, this is going to be the case for a long time that for processing technology reasons, it's going to be difficult to put a whole bunch of DRAM on a chip. It's always going to be cheaper to put it on a different chip where you can process, where you can process that chip a little bit differently. So that means it's a shared resource. You've got a whole bunch of processors trying to vie for that. How, how do you deal with that? Well, 
all of these situations, when I think of something that's shared, effectively there needs to be some sort of arbitration policy, right? You know, there might be multiple things trying to get it at it at once. Only one of them is going to win. And the question is, how do you divvy up that time? Now, the obvious thing is first come, first serve, or prioritization, or something like that. However, if you go take the route of the, the, like the flex ray bus or something, another obvious thing to do is, is round robin. And again, this gives you guaranteed uh, bandwidth. It's not the absolute highest bandwidth that you might get out of it. But again, you can predict the speed at which everything goes much better. Here is a tiny example of a chip that, that embodies some of these ideas. We didn't design this. This comes from a, a company called Parallax that does uh, uh, mostly tiny microcontrollers. And it's, it's really cute. It's called a propeller chip. And the reason is, is that uh, you can see the picture down here on the, the right-hand side. Um, it's supposed to look like an airplane propeller that goes around and says, OK, it's your turn to have the, the main memory, your turn to have the main memory. It's divided up into eight so-called cogs. Each of them are uh, single 32-bit processors, single, uh, single thread within each. Uh, but you've got eight independent PCs running on this. They each have their own local memory, rather small. Uh, but then also uh, share a large, potentially off-chip memory. And let's see, here are the statistics. Um, it's very low power. They're going off of, uh, for very tiny applications, you know, less than a third of a watt. Um, kind of slow, 80 megahertz. Um, each, of these, uh, each of these things runs at 20 MIPS, pretty modest by these standards. Um, there's uh, one large main memory, like I said, punch a bunch of tiny ones. Um, the number of cycles for each instruction is carefully spelled out in the, in the manual. It's very precise. The one thing that's somewhat unpredictable is if you go and access main memory, the amount of time it takes is basically you have to wait your turn. And it, there's just a, a simple round robin schedule that goes around and says, OK, cog one, you get the main memory. Cog two, you get main memory. And so if you look at the spec, it says anywhere from 7 to 22 cycles, depending on whether it's just about to become your turn or whether you just missed your turn. And this, if you're an electrical engineer, this would be a great chip to hack with. In fact, if you go on thinkgeek.com, they've got a, uh, a board designed for uh, programming video games in it. This is the only chip I know of that has a mask programmed ROM with a font in it that has symbols for transistors and resistors. So this is a very nerdy chip. What about an operating system in a PRET environment? Well. Process scheduling, with any luck, is not necessary. You, you probably want something that'll, that'll you know, operate sort of like a monitor where it'll load all the processes to the various, uh, various processors and so forth. Um, playing with this resource allocation stuff, you may need some initial scheduling when the application starts up. OK, what are the schedules for these various communication uh, things? Uh, but after that point, you just want the operating system to get out of the way. It should not be doing scheduling. It should just let this thing run on. Um, the one nice thing that you might want to keep around is the notion of a hardware abstraction layer, right? If you want to talk to, uh, you know, a generalized network interface, you probably want to have some translation that would go from a generalized one to a more specific one. Uh, but that would probably be the extent of it. Okay. So most of these have been ideas, right? I'm, I'm sort of arguing for a particular view. Um, now I want to talk to you about a, a very beginning experiment uh, where we actually built uh, something beginning to be a, a PrEP processor to see whether you could pull it off. Um, so this was, I took a master's student, actually no, let's see, I took a master's student, told him to do that, failed miserably, took another master's student, made a little bit more progress, then failed miserably, but the third master's student managed to pull it off. And this is the basic idea. I said, pick an ISA. He said, MIPS. I said, OK. Add one instruction. The idea of this instruction is it gives you cycle level timing control. And the, the whole idea is, so most, most embedded processors or whatever, or most processors in general, uh, have some sort of timer that generally uh, can generate an interrupt or maybe a waveform on a pin or something like that. Uh, but it's a little awkward to use. I said, let's put that in the ISA and call it deadline, call it dead for deadline. And the idea is you've got a collection of timers and you can specify a deadline. OK, I want the next block of code to be executed in exactly 100 cycles. Now, if it takes more than 100 cycles, uh, then throw an exception or something, your program is buggy, something is wrong. 
but if it takes less than 100 cycles, essentially pad it automatically with, with no ops or something like that to bring it out to 100 cycles. So it's, it's essentially an automated time waster. And so it's a very simple, this is what it looked like, you know, a bunch of general purpose registers. The only thing we added were these four timers. Um, all the instructions are utterly, utterly standard except the extra deadline instructions. The, the main point of this was that this is not a huge departure from what we're accustomed to so that compilers would work and so forth. Um, this is the architecture. So, you know, you have a register file and you throw up the counters off to the side. The counters are kind of like an additional register file. The only difference is that when you write something into them, it starts losing its value at a, at a predictable rate. And so here's what happens. If you have a deadline instruction that gets executed and the timer has not expired, what happens here on the right, so I, I say deadline with timer zero of eight and timer zero started at three, what'll happen is it'll wait until it counts down to zero and then when it does, it'll immediately reload it and then it'll start executing the next block of code. So the practical upshot of this is that if you put multiple deadline instructions uh, in a row in straight line code, the first block executes in the, the number of cycles that you ask for, the second block executes in the next set and so forth. That's one thing. The even more useful thing to do is to put a single deadline instruction in a loop. And when you do that, what happens is you're guaranteed that the loop will take uh, at least that many cycles to execute. And as long as you haven't asked it to do too many things in that period of time, it'll take exactly that many cycles to execute. So the application, uh, we, we have two demonstration applications here, but the compelling one was I wanted to do video. I wanted to generate a video signal, you know, uh, standard 640 by 480 VGA, but do it entirely in software. Code it up so that in software you're generating the, the various sync signals and then being able to dump the pixels out at the right speed. Normally you have to do this with hardware. Normally you have to code it in VHDL or Verilog, maybe run it through a, a logic synthesis tool or something like that. That's generally how you do it. Or you, you buy somebody else a, a chip from somebody else who did that. But if you start looking at this, so um, 640 by 480, it takes a 25 megahertz pixel clock. Um, that's still too fast for software. And it's actually too fast for this software, or for this particular chip, which we only got running at 50 megahertz. So um, to generate a pixel uh, every other cycle is a bit much for the software to do. Um, however, what, so what we did is the typical thing. Uh, we put a shift register in. And so the processor only then has to feed it another uh, eight pixels every eight cycles. And in fact, you can do something useful in eight cycles or 16 cycles. I forget what, what clock rate we actually got this thing running at at the end. So this is a very busy slide, and don't try to understand all of it. But the main thing is down here, uh, the main loop here under character uh, contains one deadline instruction. And this one loop in here, basically it says, go fetch the character, go fetch out the font, load it into the shift register, and then wait for the next time around. And by putting the deadline instruction in there, you're guaranteed that it's going to write to that shift register you know, every eight cycles in this case. And the result is you type this stuff in, uh, you run the program, and yep, sure enough, you get a nice stable video display coming up. And previously, I, there've been, I've seen a few other cases where people have said, okay, let's do video, and so, do video generation and software. And again, they, they end up doing something like this. Typically what they do is they very carefully count the number of cycles that each instruction goes. They're using some very simple microcontroller where you actually can count the things. And they add a lot of uh, do nothing loops and no op instructions to make the timing come out just right. I would argue that this is easier to program. One other interesting comparison is uh, the idea for this started with a, a bunch of VHDL that I've written as a demonstration for one of my classes. And this particular thing, even though it's coded in assembly, uh, and you should be, it should be able to get it even tighter by coding it in C, say, uh, replaces something like 450 lines of VHDL. So this was another argument that you can code the software, you can code real-time software a lot more efficiently than you, you can uh, code hardware. Now, arguing that you've made something smaller than VHDL is like shooting fish in a barrel. If you've ever coded in it, it's, uh, it was clear it was being, it was created by people who were paid by the keystroke to you know, so all the identifiers are like this and all the keywords are long. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's easier. 
another application, and to me, the speed at which my student was able to put this together. So uh, I told him, go do the video stuff. And he went and did the video stuff. And I said, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, here's another application. Go build a serial receiver, uh, something that'll, that'll take RS-232, uh, decode it, and then you know, do automatic baud rate detection and all the rest of that stuff. And he came back to me in like a day or two and had the thing working. And said, oh, you know, you know, I send this data and it picks it up. And this is kind of neat. Um, this actually has a variable timing loop at the core of it where you're handing it, you know, depending on the baud rate that you've guessed, it will go and do the sampling at that particular rate. So you're handing uh, this code. It goes and calculates the baud rate, turns that into something to load into the, the timer registers, and then runs itself at a different speed depending on what, uh, what that baud rate runs. So I, that's a, a well-known trick. There's nothing too magical about that. But again, what impressed me was that the student was able to take this idea, code it up in assembly language, in this idiosyncratic assembly language that we had, in a day or two, and get this interesting real-time uh, software running. And I, I don't know of anybody who's, who's done something quite like this. And so we uh, have a, a room full of these boards for a class I teach. Uh, runs at 50 megahertz, pretty modest. Unpipeline, very sloppy processor design. You know, if it was a uh, processor design class, he would have been kicked out for it. But you know, this was not the point of the the, act, the uh, activity. Uh, but it, it runs. So to summarize, the vision for all of this, like I say, is let's make performance as predictable as function. Let's make it so that you can so that there's a simple model for what each instruction in a processor does to the point where you can you know, very easily in a compiler say, compute the number of, of cycles that a particular uh, operation is going to take and then be able to predict exactly how fast something is going to go. And so that's at the ISA level. And the question is, you know, how do you fix all these other things? Well, you know, instead of caches, you've got to do scratch pads. Instead of uh, traditional pipelines, you want to do thread interleaf pipelines where there, 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 there are no bypasses and, and collisions and so forth. Uh, and I've, I've talked about all these other things. Now, I want to leave you with one final provocative hypothesis, and uh, I'm hoping we can start an argument off of this. Um, so I've been targeting uh, real-time applications, you know, hard real-time applications, where if you miss a deadline, you, you, get, a, you know, get, get a system crash with a capital C. Our hypothesis is, is that if you have more predictable, and in particular repeatable timing in parallel systems, it'll make it a lot easier to develop them, right? You might still have data races, but at least who wins the race will be consistent each time, right? If something goes wrong, it will make sense to be able to rerun the program and get the same answer if you gave it the same input. Um, another argument is that if you're going in and trying to tune the performance of something, Having, the, having a much more predictable architecture where the performance is, is at least reproducible will also help you a lot, right? I, I do compilers, and one of the big challenges is, is, so you do some optimization, and how do you know whether it actually helped, right? You do some little peephole, you know, twiddling around or whatever, and how do you know that you didn't just shoot yourself in the foot by inadvertently making it so that this, this particular instruction spilled over and went a cache line and collided and made this pipeline not work and then confused the branch predictor and all the rest of it. It's difficult to understand that. If we had these pred architectures, it would be a lot more predictable. So I'll leave, you with, I'll leave it at that and hope we can have some interesting arguments on this. Thank you. Please. So it still strikes me that there's a large application area for which construction of this approach, constructing programs this way won't actually help you. Um, I'm thinking in particular of a lot of GUI applications that use threads for uh, conceptual reasons, not performance. Reasons. That's, yeah, I would, I would agree with you there. Now, it's... Uh, the advantages there would certainly not be as strong as they are in the, in the real-time environment, certainly. Um, on the other hand, perhaps the reproducibility and the rest of that would, would help a little bit, but certainly not to the same extent. Um, but uh, you're right, that's not a particular application area I'm thinking to go after with these. I mean, certainly you should be able to code stuff like that. 
Um, but you're right, the advantages wouldn't be huge. Please. Um, the other thing was the, the node was one chip, if I recall correctly. Well, um, th so this, the grid I had at the beginning, let's see if I can bring that up. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't explain that. So the idea here was that this, this grid would be a chip. And so this node would be, well, sort of what we're expecting on a chip at this point. But the whole chip would consist of a whole bunch of these nodes uh, in some sort of communication mesh like this. So in essence, then, the CPU, the FPGA, and the memory would all have to be in the same process technology? Uh, yes. And, yes, absolutely. And currently, memory chips are not in the same process technology as CPU. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yes and no, right? I mean, you, you go and buy you know, a, a high-end Intel at the moment, and it has a whole bunch of cache memory. Now, you're right. That's, it's nowhere near as dense. Uh, or I don't know whether it's as fast as, as what you would get with the DRAMs, and certainly not as dense as Flash or something like that. And so absolutely, I agree. On the other hand, the advantages of having slower, well, smaller memory nearby the CPU is clear. Uh, but clearly for um, the huge amount of memory that you're eventually going to want, it's going to have to be on chip, off chip somehow. And so like I mentioned, there's this issue of you know, what, do you, you know, what happens when you connect up a DDR2 to it or something like that. And the answer is you've got to be careful and, and allocate the, the uh, behavior among them. Um, however, I think, it's, I think it's clear that we're always going to have some memory local to the CPU no matter what. And it, 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 you know, absolutely, this is not to scale. And exactly how to distribute all of that and allocate all of that is, is a, a tricky thing, certainly. Um, I don't know if I'm seeing real other people here. <laughs> you're all behind you're, them. You're, they're, yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're inspiring them. Please proceed. Um, did you anticipate the FPGA would be uh, like programmed at chip manufacturer time, or is this something that's you know initialized at boot time, or? Or what? So the, the vision I had was, was fairly conservative, in fact. So it would probably be like uh, the way FPGAs are used at the moment, which is basically at boot time, right? Um, most of the FPGAs, there's actually, typically there's like a little serial flash memory hanging off to the side that, that loads them rather slowly when you power the system on, but you don't notice it after that. And so the main application of these things is not reconfigurable computing or whatever, but basically so that the manufacturers can realize geez, we screwed up, let's send out a new firmware patch or something like that. And so my vision more is that uh, what will happen is the customization of the FPGA will happen by whoever buys the chip and then sells it to the end consumer, but probably you know, the configuration of that FPGA is going to be a big part of what they're selling to whoever buys these things in the end. Um, so having that change based on the, uh, the application that's running or whatever, eh, probably not. Um, my feeling is, is that more and more, and, and certainly if you look at the fraction of CPUs being used, most of them are being used for a single purpose, right? Whether there's one program or one set of programs that they are, they are built for, they run that for the whole, their entire life, and that's it. Um, and, and again, very different from the desktops than we're accustomed to. And so I think this model of you keep the, the FPGA Contents more or less constant, you know, modulo. Oh, geez, we got to fix it or what have you. Uh, but it's probably going to be used like that. And my last question was on your list. You said programming languages, mm -hmm. uh, and you've seen the assembler. Right. Uh, did you have any thoughts about uh, a real programming? Language? Right, right. A real, a real programming language, definitely. Um, so the vision I want is have uh, basically GCC dash timing. And you know, maybe pragmas or something like that where you can insert uh, timing constraints within your code or something, something along those lines. So at the very least, what I'd like to be able to do is have something like the equivalent of GProf or something like that that would static, well, GProf is dynamic, but something that would statically go in and actually tell you, okay, this is how long this chunk of code's gonna run or whatever, and then you realize, okay, you know, this is not fast enough, I better go fiddle around with it or something like that. Um, but I think for a large, uh, to a large extent, you should be, the, the base programming language ought to look like C, whatever. Now, you know, going above that, you know, to me, C should be the next assembly language for these things. And then there's a question of what generates the C and how you do that. Um, I have a few ideas about that. That's a whole other talk. Uh, it's not at all clear how to do that. And clearly programming these things is going to be a challenge. Uh, but programming the next generation of chips is always a challenge, it seems. So.
that's the idea. So what happened, you mentioned uh, when, when the Hamilton's training was out there at one time, uh, uh, at one time what happened? Uh, well, so at the moment, uh, if, you miss, if you miss a deadline, what happens is the counter, that timer counts down to zero and then, and then stops at zero. And so when it hits the next deadline instruction, it just says, oh, it's already at zero. It just runs right through it. Now, that's probably not the behavior you want. What you might want is uh, to throw an exception when that happens so that when, you, when you're testing your program, it'll immediately tell you, you know, bang, immediately, you missed a deadline. Here's the problem. Go fix it, right? You know, missed a deadline at, at line 57 in your program or what have you. That's one possibility. Uh, another possibility would be to you know, keep it the way it is, but then you know, have some other larger counter that would tell you, well, OK, you know, how, much, how many times did I, I flip over? Um, other people have proposed things like, well, if you miss this deadline, but then you can come in ahead on this next one, then maybe you're OK for more soft real-time stuff. There's a variety of things. And clearly you, clearly, you want some choices in all of that. The idea here is not to sort of argue that I've got all the details about what those instructions ought to do, but more just we ought to have this ability somehow. Right, right. Uh, it's you know like like most things you put in a processor, you want to be able to change its behavior a little bit. No more arguments. I guess it's too late in the day. <laughs>